Happy New Year, everybody. My name is Andres. I'm Scott. I'm Abe. And welcome to Between Two Stands, a show that takes a closer look at the personalities that make up the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And I don't know about you guys, but uh, I was very happy to say goodbye to 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, usually, I'm usually very nostalgic, you know, like you kind of are pensive and thinking about the year before, you know, and, and you're kind of sad when the clock strikes 12. But like, I was just, I was just like ecstatic. I was like, yes, like next. Yeah. Thank you, next. Honestly, I was, I was in bed at 9 p.m. I felt, <laughs> <laughs> wow, I felt like the, the sooner I went to you. sleep, the sooner it'd be 2021. <laughs> nice. You know, I, I was, I'm with you. Like I was happy to see the year change, but I was also like, well, we have no idea what we're getting into now. <laughs> That's true. Like, That's yeah. true. It's just a date. It's just a date. <laughs> yeah. It's like, here we but go. It, another one. <laughs> it did feel like a fresh start for some reason. I don't know. It just, it, it did kind of feel like a, a cleanse, you know? Even though it's yeah. just a date. <laughs> I, I, I think we need those markers now. It's it's nice to have that. So <laughs> yeah, do exactly. you guys uh, have any resol resolutions or do you just sort of live your lives as, as is? Oh, that's a good question. That is a good question. I kind of live my life as is, man. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not one to like make resolutions. <laughs> I, here's what, here's my strategy. I try to make the most vague resolution possible. It's like live a little healthier, and then <laughs> and then it's not uh, it's not so much like oh these cookies they're it's mental health they make me happier. And, uh, and, <laughs> and then, then one and then when you don't eat that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. When you don't I mean, order that when you don't order that second pizza, you're like, I did it, I did, I did it. it. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, well, anyway, uh, we have a, a special guest today, um, Principal Tubist. Wait, are you saying that this is a special guest? I, I think we need to say he's more one of a kind. He's one he of a kind. Only, he's a one of a kind. One of him in the orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, I just like it because every, oh, every guest is special. It's like we've got oh, a yeah, special yeah. week. This is a new addition to oh, the family, by the way. That's Lucy. a special guest. She, for she sure. might make uh, unwarranted appearances. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Dennis Nulty, Principal Tubist. Dennis Nulty. Tuba? You know, you're tuba. supposed tuba. to know these things. Tuba. We're yeah, professional. No. It's not Tuba. <laughs> Principal Tuba. <laughs> Principal Tuba, Dennis okay. Nulty. A native of upstate New York. Dennis Nolte was appointed the position of Principal Tuba with the DSO in 2009. He earned his undergraduate and performance certificate at the Eastman School of Music and finished his graduate studies at New England Conservatory. He has played on stage with many major orchestras nationwide. In addition, his versatility as a musician includes playing with brass quintets, marching bands, and jazz ensembles. He currently is the tuba professor at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. Are we gonna Are we gonna mention your shirt? Oh, yeah. What is your shirt? My shirt. His shirt is uh, yeah, the shirt Santa Fe says... Opera. That's not us. That's also not between two stands. I mean, one of these things is not like the other, <laughs> and that thing is Abe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and he's also a ginger. Well, I feel like we need to call this out because in our last episode, uh, our new maestro, Yadar Pinyamini, called you out for not wearing your shirt. And did you lose it? I mean, I think your your New Year's resolution should just be to wear my shirt. Well, so I do wear the shirt sometimes, not when we record. So, oh, that's, mm. that's isn't that weird? So, because I like to represent. I have one, I have one for every day of the week. I... <laughs> <laughs> just, is is do you have it written down that today's shirt's Tuesday? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Is it, is it I'm that tag? organized. Does it have your initials? Too? Anyone who knows me knows I'm that organized. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> um, I can start wearing the shirt more if you'd like. Well, I think we should leave it to the viewers. Okay. Viewers, please post in the comments section whether or not you want <laughs> Abe to wear the between two stands shirt okay. more. And, and, and we're gonna listen to Abe's mom the most. <laughs> 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 as, oh, as one yeah. should, right? Yeah. Perfect. Well, with that, 
Now, before we hear a performance by our special guest, here is Larry's joke of the week. So did you hear there was a break in a robbery at the Apple store at Somerset? That's true. Uh, police are looking for eyewitnesses. One and only Dennis here. Murphy. He is. Welcome. Dennis welcome. 
<laughs> Here I am. It's great to see you guys. How is everybody? <laughs> doing well. Doing doing well. Good to happy, see you. happy New Year, everyone, right? Happy New Year. Yeah, fingers happy crossed New for Year. 21. 2021. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It can only go up, right? Don't uh, hope so. I mean, <laughs> we just started. We just started. Let's not let's not jinx it. <laughs> so Dennis, Dennis, tell us about your uh, the piece you chose. That um, that lovely piece that we just heard. Oh, uh, you know, it's one of my favorites. You, as a tuba player, we're kind of always thirsty for music, right? They're, the tuba as the baby of the orchestra as one of the newer instruments. We're always trying to track something down. And Malcolm Arnold wrote a ton of music for brass players. And that piece, The Fantasy for Tuba, is one of my faves. It's it's pretty accessible. It's, you know, for us, it has some beautiful melodies, I think, and is 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 kind of short, sweet, and beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. So one of our first questions that we wanted to ask you after after that was like, why the tuba? You just mentioned that you're like so thirsty for music, and uh, when you have melodies, maybe isn't as common as say the violin or something. So, what drew you to that instrument? Oh boy, um, when I was a child, I would be described as a husky child. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I originally started on the cello, Abe, and oh, I, I loved it. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved the cello. And hilariously, the orchestra director used to snort when she laughed. <laughs> Miss Peck in Rotterdam, New York. It drove me up the wall. My Shout mother out talked to about Ms. it. Peck. Shout <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it drove me crazy. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And my mother talked about it. as a kid. I just come back. It's like it's driving me up the wall. So I did the cardinal sin. I jumped ship. Um, I think I started the cello in third grade. Second or third grade, because you could start string instruments sooner, right. but bailed. I, I jumped ship. I started on the trumpet, and in the way that only a great junior high band director can say, he said that I had euphonium lips, which is a very polite way to say that I couldn't play the trumpet at all. <laughs> so I went to the euphonium, loved it. This is in fifth grade, and in sixth grade, we, we trained school. We went to a different place for junior high, and there, the the band director approached me and said, hey, you look like you can carry the sousaphone. Congratulations. And so in sixth grade, <laughs> I started the tuba. And it was a, you know, it, it was always like a little bit of a joke, right? It, it wasn't something that I, I necessarily sought out. It was always kind of funny, you know? And the sousaphone is a funny sort of device. And for little kids, there are chairs with um, these sort of posts that you can kind of rest the instrument in. And, but it didn't fit very well. So... My instrument was duct taped into this chair. <laughs> so I'd have to sort of get on my hands and knees and crawl into the instrument. And it was, it was a joke. Oh, and so I have no, at some point it got a little more serious and I started to practice some more. And, you know, fast forward 20 years later and here we are. So for tuba players, and, and more And Dennis than, still, he still than... tapes it. He still tapes it on, on Orchestra Hall stage, by the way. <laughs> It's there right now. Yeah. It's there right now. <laughs> Duct tape holds the world together, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, 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 no, no, that that was it. That was my joke. <laughs> it was a good one. Yeah. Good one. Um, uh, so wait, uh, for for those who don't know, the sousaphone. Well, like when people think about a tuba that wraps around them and like the bell is up above their head and everything, that's the sousaphone and the tuba's uh, horn. You sit down and it's in front of you. And the yeah, bell. Totally. So, just and, uh, clarifying that. Yeah, and, and like the tuba factoid for all the Jeopardy or Trivial Pursuit players out there is they're basically the same instrument, just wrapped separately, wrapped differently, I should say. Where the, the instrument you see me playing on stage rests on my lap. If you kind of just bent the metal in a different way, so if there was a bigger sort of loop of the instrument, that would be a sousaphone. I, and that's for marching, right? Like it, just to make it makes it easier for marching? You can hold it. Yeah, you can hold it. Yeah, I like that. Um, the the band director, you know, congratulations. You can play. You look like you can hold a sousaphone. It's like a sixty pound yeah, thing that, that you're gonna it. stand outside and play. Yeah, that was it. That was it. <laughs> nice. I did Good it. For you. I, I I was handed a freshman year of, of high school. I was handed a um a big bass drum from like I I wanted to see if I liked marching band, and. <laughs> they gave me they gave me a massive bass drum to like hold in front of me that goes on my neck and it was so uncomfortable and i'm like 
absolutely not. And I just walked out. I just walked out of the room, never turned back. Nice. Uh, so it's good that it's good that you stuck with that. Well, yeah. Well, it, you know, it wasn't an option. I tried to get out of marching band because I played bass in the string orchestra in high school and I sang in the choir. And um, it, the band director told me if I stopped playing in the marching band, I couldn't play in any other musical groups. I was the only tuba player. It really, really small school, so I think he was desperate. Well, I feel like being the only tuba player is sort of a common thing for a tubist, though. Excuse it's me, like you're the you. only one in in the orchestra. It's usually one in an orchestra. Um, you know, rarely we'll have a section like a tuba section. You know, and you're kind of lumped in with this low brass thing. So, like, is that something that you particularly enjoy, like being a solo instrument all the time, or is, is it? Do you consider it a solo instrument? Like, what is that like for you? I do. Um, it, you touched on one of the most interesting and strangest parts of being a tuba player. It's that really nobody knows what I do. Um, to kind of put it through the lens of getting into a job, it's something I work with my students at Oberlin and anybody that comes to Detroit or Ohio for a lesson, is a part of your auditioning on the, the tuba, the harp, and timpani at times can be really strange particularly for tubists and harpists, if you, if you think of it this way, by the time I retire, I will not be involved in the audition for my replacement. And Lord willing, I will be on a beach with a cocktail about this big, hopefully some <laughs> umbrellas out of there. If you can hear the ocean sort of rolling behind me, that's where I'll be. So <laughs> being that only person in an audition, you not only have to sort of stand out from these incredible players that are there now, but you also have to kind of sort of wow and educate the committee at the same time. Um, you know, I'm lucky in Detroit that I sit next to really great brass players, particularly really great bass or bass trombone players and trombone players. So they have some idea, but there's not that sort of knowledge. You know, when, when you guys auditioned, there was somebody that very, very intimately understood what you were doing in some way. So it's, it's strange and it, it speaks to this weird camaraderie of tuba players um, because one, we never see each other. You know, it, it's really, really rare that we, you know, we do a two tuba week or something on stage with multiple tuba players. So when we get together, it's this, it's like this communal group hug of you understand, <laughs> you know, you know, you, you get it, you know, and not a, a good or a bad way. It's just, they understand the ins and outs and, you know, being the only one, you know, sort of being new, the, you know, the tuba playing is, is really developing really quickly. You know, if. <laughs> You go back to, you know, 40 years from now backwards, you'd be amazed at what you were hearing. Um, oftentimes, the tuba players and orchestras were just trombone players that went down the section. To now where, I mean, even I'm starting to see high school students play things that I was working on in college. It's, yeah. You know, people are sort of uncovering what the instrument is about. So it's, it's, it's fun, you know. It's an exciting time. It's a weird time. So, so, so that's like a, a, another question that we kind of had is um you, you mentioned that there isn't really a tuba community in the orchestra obviously it's just you but what is the tuba community like like in, when you were in school or or what is it like now you know um when you when you see students at oberlin um or when you um you know see people at conventions like what what, what is it like when you finally see that rare uh that rare uh, tuba sighting <laughs> Well, it's, uh, you know, it's like, I think like any group, um, you know, tuba players, you know, it's, I think one of the, there, there's kind of two main aspects. One is, you know, tuba players tend to be some, I would say, some of the most intense or knowledgeable listeners of orchestras. You know, I don't play as much as really all you guys, particularly Abe. I mean, you're the, you're the champion per note of this group of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have the, you know, I have the best seat in the house to see a DSO concert. You know, I'm there. So it, it's always great to talk to like a group of tuba players about sort of what's happening in their orchestras. And outside of that, it's, you know, with that free time where you can let your mind wander in rehearsals, it's really varied. You know, off the top of my head, a, a good buddy of mine, um, who plays tuba in, in an orchestra is also a NASA engineer. Um, you know, he, he worked on every Hubble telescope mission at mission control so as a kid i saw my buddy bob on tv you know at his station 
There's a tuba player. At one point, he was the national president of the Three Stooges fan club. So it's it's there's always so something. which which one's his day job? Like I, which one is his? <laughs> You'd have to ask him. You know, Definitely the Stooges fan club. Yeah, like, yeah, that, that I, pays I big say, money. Yeah, yeah. I would say that it was tuba playing, but I'm sure if you asked him, he would have a different opinion. Yeah. So it's really varied and it's super fun. It's a really niche thing. Um, there's a great you know there's only a handful of jobs in the country to be a principal tuba player full time in an orchestra. They're certainly under thirty probably under 25 so when you get around those guys it's it's a blast it's really really fun so so dennis i'm kind of curious like how you would describe your role what would you say your role in the orchestra is um if you could if you can describe it yeah it's interesting and it's because i'm a principal member and people at, at times will ask me about that and it speaks to being you know, when you're a section of one, you're also in every section. So a large part of my job, and it depends on composers. Um, you know, if I'm playing, well, what's a great, if I'm playing Strauss, Strauss and Bruckner, it's, I'm really, I'm a very, I'm the bass end of the horn choir and the bass end of primarily the, the cylindrical brass, trumpets and trombones. Prokofiev, however, that's where he really unlocked sort of the, the beauty of the instrument. And what I love about playing Prokofiev is that even though I'm a one-person section, in those symphonies, in those tone poems, I'm playing with everybody. Um, in Prokofiev symphonies, I'm I'm really, I play a ton with the cellos. We have these beautiful melodies together often, a lot with the basses, very, very little with the trombones. And what I love about it is... Um, you know, sometimes my folders will be a little thinner than other people's at work, you know, maybe just like... <laughs> but Prokofiev symphonies are the one time where I can show up, you know, if, if my folder looks like this, if you can see that, you know, the trombone player's folders look like that. And you're like, and yes. believe me, I tell them about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many notes you got? Oh, really? My that folder that little? is thicker than wow. yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's rare. It's super rare. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, I'm a principal of you know, of my own weird section, but I think that's a, an acknowledgement to how much, you know, how far my feelers go out into the orchestra at times. Well, and that's why I think a lot of tuba players are drawn to Prokofiev, not only for these great melodies, but it, it really just brings this um, interesting and fascinating look into just ensemble chops. It's a great way to check in with the viola section. And how many times can you do that for us? It's, you're too close, too close for you. Too close to the violas. <laughs> no, I, I remember a couple times in recent memory where you also moved around maybe to just get in touch a little bit better with different sections. Uh, I think we were doing maybe Shostakovich violin concerto or something. And, you know, that has a lot of horn and tuba. So you were really close to us and it just helps make the balance and, uh, and pitch and everything else that you just need to listen for that much yeah. easier. Yeah, it's nice to sort of be around the folks you're playing with. Um, we don't do it too much here. Um, early on, it might've been my first year. It was the only time doing Bruckner in Detroit where, um, and it was Roger Norrington and he, he's great. I always love playing for him. I know Abe, you know, we can talk about vibrato at another time. Uh, <laughs> but he was really sweet. You know, he was the first conductor to come up to me and ask. Sometimes because in some Bruckner symphonies, the tuba is really a bass horn voice. It, it, it's really, you know, you look at how the notes are arranged and composed. It's it, that's really where it belongs. And sometimes conductors will have the tuba player sit, you know, I guess sort of ninth horn, you know, right. far down to the end of your row. Um, I opted, I think because I was new and I, you know, it, it, I think the, the performance practice in Detroit was to sort of keep the tuba player planted where it was. But every now and again, you shuffle around. We just did a Holiday Brass Pops concert. And what was great about that, and it's a weird silver lining to how strange the stage looks these days, but I was right next to the drum kit player, which was Joe. That was awesome, you know, because in that concert, I was essentially a bass. I was a, you know, a yeah. jazz, you know, pizzicato bass playing and, and just playing the bass lines. And, you know, normally we're fairly close on stage, but that, that being right next to Joe just helped the feel so much. Absolutely. It's amazing how a little bit of, you know, like your placement, even if it's just a few feet, changes your perspective. It can be huge. You know? Yeah, it can yeah. be really huge. 
Well, I think one of the challenges, especially now with the orchestras being spread out, having the, the social distancing on stage is really tough. But even in normal um, uh, precedented times, as opposed to these unprecedented times, um, <laughs> the, the distance factor for certain instruments is is huge like having to adjust you know if you're the tuba player and you're listening to the viola section what you're hearing is the past and so you ha kind of have this uh, disconnect between what you see and what you hear and, and that can be that can be such a challenge so it is interesting when you're next to the people but i want to talk about something uh you know less important we all know that tuba is the one thing you live for it's more important than anything else but you already mentioned a beach. those those are your words <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned a beach and uh we know that you also happen to have a love for scuba diving so if you do, like really maybe do. a good way to present this is when you can go somewhere again um where do you think you might like to go what for for like a scuba trip uh you know at, at this stage of the game anywhere <laughs> <laughs> uh, the bottom of the Detroit River will be fine. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm about probably like two weeks away from just setting up in my tub, just to <laughs> get back there. Um, but you know, if, if you know, since we're we're kind of fantasizing here, I would say you know my sort of the, my top bucket list is in Cuba. It's a place called the Queen's Garden, and the, the quick history of it is early on, I think in the late '60s or early '70s. Castro protected this huge coral reef structure. And it's it's really the sort of the last glimpse into what coral reefs looked like when they were very, very healthy. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, been the longest protected um, sort of coral reef, certainly with the embargoes and sort of the impossibility of getting to Cuba for travel. It just kept people away. And that is, I would love to see it. Um, you know, there, there's tons of sharks, which sort of, implies that the, the reef system is very, very healthy, but you can, it's just, just curtains of fish as you're diving from what I understand. Uh, me and my wife were in Africa a while back now, a few years back, and we did a snorkeling trip in Mozambique. And that was very similar. It was at this, it was like a two hour boat ride to this island. And I had never seen anything like that. You know, in the Caribbean and some of the other places I've been diving, you'll see large schools of fish, but it's, it's, amazing when you see the the huge clams with like the the electrified openings and angelfish swimming by that you can't see the school of fish it's um it's fascinating have you gone in michigan many times many times um it was something getting into diving it was tricky for me uh my wife doesn't she loves the water is just a little intimidated by the ocean as a lot of folks are so i, I tried for years to convince her but it's it's not a, a sport or an event where you kind of want to force people to do. So I finally got certified myself. And one of the things I, I kind of told myself was be prepared for cold water. You know, it'd be great if you could be in the Caribbean all the time, but it's not like I can just duck down there, you know, a couple times a month to go diving. So yeah. I've done a few wreck dives in Huron and Michigan. Um, wow. I spent a lot of time in quarries around. Um, at some point, some of the most legendary wreck diving is in Lake Superior. You know, the water's so cold that nothing lives there. So there's no, you know, basically small bacteria that eat away material. So quite a bit. It, it's it's brisk, refreshing compared yeah, to the dude. European. Um, this is kind of a wonky question. Uh, do you the do the dry kind. suits? Um, is it a dry suit for like those? those, those and do you times? wear a tuxedo underneath? Uh, I, I'm wearing a tuxedo underneath this, you know, just in case. Just in case. Uh, so that's a great question, Scott. My my next, so there's there's sorts of skills, right? And, and I very very much believe that knowledge is power. So I'm doing a ton of courses, right, to make myself feel safer, to be safer for my dive partners. And the next skill that I was gearing up towards right before this hit was dry suit certification. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Fingers wow, crossed. you need to be certified for that. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a big difference in buoyancy. So, oh, like, oh. you know, your wetsuits, you get wet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that but it holds the same water against your skin and you eventually warm up and it kind of keeps you there. Yeah. But a dry suit sort of keeps you dry, which then keeps you warmer. I mean, your face still gets real cold. Very cold. <laughs> refreshed. It gets refreshed. <laughs> yeah. It's all how you look at it. Yeah. Um, 
So, Dennis, another thing that uh, I know about you is your, your love for music of all kinds, um, and I respect that a lot. You, you show me a lot of really cool um, artists that I've never heard of. In fact, you just sent me one today that was some German band that uh, – Yeah, how do you pronounce great? that? How do you how- – I was like stool flogger meister or something. It's impossible, folks. It's impossible. <laughs> it was, there was a lot of umlauts, but it was great. But um, and then and you you have a pretty extensive record collection. You you and uh, your wife Gabe um, collect records, two of which I just have to mention stand out to me. The 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 whole record is whale sounds. Whale sounds. And the other the other record is trains, just trains going yeah. by, different types of trains. But like, first of all, how many records do you own, and what are some ones that like stand out? Uh, well, certainly whale songs and train sounds. Um, <laughs> yeah, <those laughs> not really, not really. Uh, we have a lot of records. Um, my, I, I was lucky that I inherited sort of a pre-existing record collection, which is amazing. Um, so we have, uh, boy, I mean maybe fifteen hundred, two thousand albums. Um, wow. But. Uh, half of that collection or, or maybe even more came in 10 huge boxes all at once. Um, for some of my favorites, uh, you know, everybody buys sort of records or albums or music differently. Um, you know, I'll try to track things down. You know, I like this group and this producer also worked with these groups, you know, so I'll, I'll sort of, you know, go down those rabbit holes. My wife, who I would say is the most amazing sort of record shopper in our family buys exclusively by sight <laughs> like <laughs> entirely by album cover and some of our most favorite albums were bought just because the album looked interesting um so if i had i could probably i, I think there's three that i would you know sort of like desert island albums for me one is an album called switched on santa and it's wendy carlos one of the originators of like moog synthesizer performances Really, and it's spectacular, and that that's a whole deep dive if you want to understand kind of how hard and amazing it was to produce these sounds when that album was recorded. I also grew up with it randomly, and that album shaped my, you know, I have no idea where my mother got it from. She certainly didn't collect synthesizer music. It 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 was just there, and as a kid, you know, an old Mo console is like a room. It's huge, and you know, there's this great picture of Santa there with his headphones. You kind of changing <laughs> patches, but you know my love of Philip Glass, um, Sean Pite Zeiger, that band that I sent you. This, my love of sort of synthesizers or electronic music all came from that. So that's definitely a Desert Island one. Um, probably until Gabrielle, my wife, murdered me. Certainly not one of her favorites. I, I can I can listen to synthesizer music at the house when she's not here, and she can listen to Jewel at the house when I'm not here. So it's you know relationships are about communication and teamwork, and that, right? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is compromise. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, the other two, really quick, are one is one that Gabrielle bought, which is uh, Billy Ray Stewart, and the album has this picture of this woman at a microphone, and it's not a woman, not a female singer. Um, Billy Stewart, or it's just, it's just Billy Stewart, um, is a, a male vocalist, and the, it's impossible to describe. Um, I encourage everybody to just go, just look up Billy Stewart Summertime uh, and check it out. And the third is one that I got called Sounds of the Loon. Super weird, great album to take a nap to. But what I loved about it is uh, where I'm sort of where I'm from originally, upstate New York, Albany the Albany area, there's this really, really fantastic record store. And it, to me, it reminds me of sort of when I was a kid, sort of trolling, like diving for records back in the day, before it sort of became popularized and glammed up, there were like the, all these murky, dusty places with just records stacked everywhere. And it captures those feels. And this <laughs> album, uh, Call of the Loon, excuse me, Call of the Loon, I picked it up with a bunch of other stuff. And the guy at the counter just looked like, you know, some of my old buddies from high school, a total punk rocker, you know, a little older, middle aged, but the leather jacket, the piercings, the tattoos, all, all these items. And as he's digging through, he's not saying anything. Call the loon. He goes, oh, call the room. Nice. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> he was familiar with like one of the weirdest esoteric albums I've ever bought. And, um, I will stand by, you know, swing on through the house sometime. I'll put it on, sit on the couch, take a nap. It's perfect. <laughs> nice. 
And it's just loon calls, right? That is all it is. That is all it is. <laughs> I think you awesome. were there. Well, I think Andres was there for the legendary. Gabrielle came home from sort of our local record shop, which is amazing, uh, Found Sound. She's like, oh, I got this Train album. I said, I, I have a pretty good idea what that's going to sound like. like well, <laughs> well, we're not sure. So we put it on, and you know, it's kind of silent. Then it's it's classic. <laughs> it's just trains going by. <laughs> Two sides of an album of trains going by. It's freaking awesome, man. Very niche. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but... um. Yeah, but yeah, man, and another thing that I mean, you're a man of many, many talents, and another thing that you um, showed us you could all do was um, woodworking, man. You, you. Hopefully, we can get a picture of your of that deck you built this this last summer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you're pretty incredible designing and and everything. I mean, it's 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 amazing. What what got you into that? Like, you know, when when did you get into that? Well, you know, I, I think really just sort of out of necessity, you know, uh, when me and Gabrielle bought our first house, there were just things that had to be do had to be done. Um, and I mean, it, it's, you know, I, you just sort of meet folks that do stuff like that. And they always really kind of inspired me. Right. I was always amazed. Um, Drace, actually, there's the old, I believe, principal percussionist of San Francisco, Jack Van Geem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember talking to him one time and, and he's such a, you know, what I would say a nice, normal dude, you know, and it was just very personable and we we're talking and he essentially described how he was building his house by himself, you know, bought the, the property, pitched a tent, dug the foundation. And I was so impressed by that. I, I was absolutely floored that, you know, this person with this huge career and, and living this life, teaching and performing and touring, you know, also found the time to do this stuff. And, and that was eye opening. So it started with, simple things, building shelves around the house, ultimately to sort of framing out some rooms. Um, and then at the new house, um, sort of building the pergola and, and the railings for the deck and that sort of thing. Um, and it's, you know, for me, you know, I come from sort of a family of trades persons. Um, and my grandfather was an iron worker in New York, um, you know, worked on, you know, I think he worked on the Tappan Zee Bridge and maybe the Empire State Building, you know, way back. And my dad's a steel worker. His dad was a uh, carpenter. And there's something really, really nice and rewarding about creating something. You know, what what we do is so ephemeral, right? It's It speaks to why live concerts are so nice. Even on, you know, the best recording days with the best recording engineers, nothing really captures that live concert experience. It, sometimes you can trap lightning in a bottle there. But it's rare, you know, it's rare that you get the same sort of emotional impact. And it, not that my deck, you know, brings me to tears you know, <laughs> when I see it, but th there's something I find very rewarding about, you know, spending the time and creating something and then having that item there, you know, being able to hold it, to see it, you know, to give it as a gift or, or something to that effect. I've heard yeah. this, I've heard this before from another, another brass player who uh, uh, on, had a side gig as a carpenter and it was mm -hmm. like, you know, we spend so much time building our playing in the practice room and it's so much effort and so much work. And then at the end, we can have one bad day and it seems like it's all gone down the, the toilet. Um, but with, with his carpentry, it's like, yeah, you know, I built it and then it's built and it's there. <laughs> like, hey, done. It's, true. Yeah. it's really nice. It's, uh, it's really nice. And, you know, I think, I think one of the reasons why a lot of musicians have very, very high level hobbies, right? Or hobbies they're very passionate about. And it's it's fascinating in the DSO. Um, you know, if, if you think about Paul Winger, he, that guy was a world famous um, gardener. Yeah. He just, you know, just in passing gave me, I mean, it's a, it was the bromeliad quarterly, I believe, which is the plant that he has created his own species of. So <laughs> it's, that, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not yeah. only being a cellist in the orchestra, but I mean, how do you make up a plant? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't know how you do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it's also sort lab, of, you know. yeah, right. Yeah. You know, sort of alchemy. You know, just incantations <laughs> on a full moon. So I it's nice. Special. Yeah, also nice to have just sort of some kind of outlet for 
kind of creative thought, right? It's because you can get a little burned out. There's only so much time you can spend with a tuba. Believe me. Um, <laughs> so it, it's nice to sort of engage Never. all those aspects of playing, you know, that I use on stage in the practice room separately, right? It, it's a little less stressful. It's a little more fun. If I make a bad cut, it's not a performance. I can just go out and buy more lumber. It's, it's yeah. a good thing. I remember I, when I visited you uh, a few weeks ago, you you were in your wood shop area, and we walked inside, and, and your wife was like, yeah, he's been out there for like seven hours. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. And you did, you did have that like seven-hour look about you. You were like, Hey man, you want to you want to see this wood that I just cut? I was like, oh. Uh, all right. <laughs> it's always like, it's always thrilling times over here in Ferndale for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey man, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today, man. It's a pleasure talking to you. Oh, absolutely. My my pleasure. It's great seeing you guys. Yeah, really good to see you. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis.